the embattled UN ambassador, Susan Rice. She's under fire, accused of making misleading statements about the deadly attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya. But after two days on Capitol Hill, Republican criticism remains sharp, and her future as a possible nominee for Secretary of State is uncertain at best. Our senior congressional correspondent could increase the chances of a market rattling. Susan Rice to get some harsh criticism after yesterday's meeting with uh, three Republican senators, McCain, Graham, and Ayotte, because they have been leading the charge against her. It was quite different to hear that kind of concern from one of the last remaining centrist Republicans in the Senate. Of all the GOP senators, moderate Susan Collins would be one of the most likely to throw Susan Rice a lifeline. It didn't happen. I continue to be troubled by the fact that the U.N. ambassador decided to play what was essentially a political role at the height of a contentious presidential election campaign. After meeting with Rice for more than an hour, Collins emerged questioning her judgment and giving the public what turned out to be incorrect information in the days after the deadly attack in Benghazi. And the main Republican was lukewarm about the prospect of Rice as Secretary of State. If President Obama were to nominate Susan Rice to be the next Secretary of State, could you support that nomination? I would need to have additional information before I could support her nomination. Collins has gone out of her way to support Rice in the past, even introducing Rice, who has family ties to Maine, at a confirmation hearing for U.N. Ambassador. The people of Maine are proud of what this remarkable woman has accomplished. Whether Collins supports Rice now for a promotion is crucial because of the raw numbers. Rice would likely need 60 votes to overcome a filibuster by these GOP senators. Assuming all 55 senators who will caucus with Democrats next year vote to confirm Rice, she would still need five Republicans to get to 60. It's hard to see where those five GOP votes for Rice would be if even moderate Collins doesn't support her. To be sure, the president has not nominated Rice for the post yet. Another Republican senator who met with Rice made clear he thinks it would be a mistake. We want someone of independence. I would just ask the president uh, to step back for a moment and realize that all of us here hold the Secretary of State uh, to a very different standard than, than most cabinet members. But hours later at a White House cabinet meeting, the president offered Rice fresh, full-throated support. Susan Rice is extraordinary. <laughs> Couldn't be prouder of the job that she's done at USUI. With that, members of Obama's cabinet broke out in applause. With Susan Rice looking on, smiling broadly. Now, Wolf, I spoke with two members of the Senate Republican leadership today who said they think at this point it would be very tough to see Susan Rice getting confirmed by the Senate, especially after the difficult meeting she's had here this week. On the other side, I've also spoken to Senate Democratic sources who say they're not so sure, uh, because if the president does to decide to spend the considerable political capital it would take to push Susan Rice's nomination through, he could win. Why is that? They say because so far her explanations for giving incorrect information about the Benghazi attack have, for the most part, been in private meetings. She hasn't been able to do that in public. If she does it in public, if she does it well, they think at that point it would be hard for Republicans to block her, but that would be committing to a long road by the president. Tough road indeed. All right, Dana, thanks very much. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Kate Baldwin is here, of course, with us as well. CNN National Security Analyst Peter Bergen writes about Susan Rice and her Benghazi remarks in a new piece on CNN.com, and he questions some Republican theories. In the piece, Peter writes, in part, he says, this is not conspiracy, this is fog of war. And Peter is here in uh, the situation, situation Room joining us. Uh, our national security contributor, Fran Townsend, is here as well. She's in New York because she's a member of the CIA's External Advisory Committee. Uh, explain what you mean by fog of war in, in the context of Susan Rice, what she said, for example, on those five Sunday talk shows five days after this attack in Benghazi. Well, we know from any major news event, just think about the coverage of Osama bin Laden when he was killed. The first stories that were, you know, he, you know, he died in a firefight, he used his wife as a human shield, that all turned out to be wrong. Uh, and that wasn't a conspiracy, that was just bad information about a chaotic event on the other side of the world uh, in the middle of, uh, you know, sort of a battle situation. And I think the central premise of the Republicans' uh, attack against Susan Rice 
basically went away when Petraeus uh, testified behind closed doors. He said that the talking points that she was using had been changed by the intelligence community. And we, that was reaffirmed by Mike Morrell yesterday, the, the, the acting director of the CIA. So instead of a political conspiracy to rewrite the talking points, it was the intelligence community not wanting to tip off the group that they suspected of the attack. So it wasn't misleading the American public. It was intended to mislead America's enemies. But, you know, Fran, it's pretty surprising to me, maybe it's even shocking, that yesterday when they were all up there, Mike Morrell, the acting CIA director, with Susan Rice, meeting with these Republican uh, lawmakers, at one point Mike Morrell suggested that it was the FBI, in fact, that had removed uh, some of the words about al-Qaeda in these talking points, only much later, several hours later in the day, to call them back and say he misspoke. It was really the CIA that did that. Here's the question. Two months after all of this, how could he get that wrong? You, you know, Wolf, I, I, it's confounding even to me. But, I, you know, I will tell you, this is, I think, what, what we're seeing here is Susan Rice is being held to account for what have been sort of a whole series of missteps by the administration in both their the substantive handling of this and their ability to explain what happened. And of course, every time they make one more mistake, it fuels this conspiracy theory that, as Peter suggests, that, that there's some sort of political conspiracy behind this. I'll tell you, Wolf, having lived through my share of crises in the White House when I was, was serving, you know, you can't chalk off to malevolence or, or sort of deception what can easily be explained by, as Peter says, the fog of war or just incompetence, that they're not coordinating, they haven't looked at each other's information and they're just they continue to repeat these mistakes uh, that fuel the ire of Congress and Fran you know she's had this series of briefings on the hill now and I want to play something that Susan Collins Senator Collins said after her briefing with Ambassador Rice listen to this I'm also very troubled by the fact that we seem not to have learned from the 1998 bombings of two of our embassies in Africa at the time when Ambassador Rice was the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs. She has her facts right there, Fran, but it, the question is, is it fair for the senator to be drawing comparisons between the 1998 embassy bombings and what has just happened this year in Benghazi, do you think? Well, look, Kate, let's, let's, what is factually accurate is, in, in fact, during the Clinton administration, Susan Rice was the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. But that's sort of where the facts stop here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, an after, uh, there was an accountability review board after the East Africa embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, just as there's being conducted now. There was a report. There were lessons learned from that. And, in fact, the lessons that were learned from East Africa affected across multiple administrations everyone. embassy security so I'd we did like learn those lessons let's remember well. benghazi was a consulate it got temporary waivers from those security uh, requirements and so this is really quite different look it, it is also a failure in terms of the security precautions but it, it's quite different than the east africa embassy bombings and you know uh, I, I just want to bring uh, peter back into this conversation one of the things they're going after susan rice is uh, on those sunday talk shows she said the u.s has decimated al-Qaeda. Uh, and uh, these Republican lawmakers saying al-Qaeda seems to be okay right now, even though bin Laden is dead, some of the top leadership is dead. They're still out there, all these al-Qaeda affiliates, sympathizers. Yeah, uh, the Arab Spring is now almost two years in, in the making. Um, and obviously, it's been a complicated process. But if al-Qaeda's, you know, if, if the full extent of its ability to attack the United States is killing four Americans, obviously a great tragedy in Benghazi, in countries, you know, there are many countries in the Middle East where these kinds of um, you know, activities are happening. You know, it, it's not a very good score for al-Qaeda. Don't bear in mind, uh, uh, Wolf, that the Benghazi consulate was not an embassy in the kind of conventional sense. It wasn't, it was lightly defended. It was an easy target. It was overrun. Um, so I don't think you can sort of say al-Qaeda is suddenly back because they managed to attack and, and kill four Americans, you know, in, in a Middle Eastern country recently ravaged by war. Um, you know, certainly it, it's worrisome, uh, but it doesn't mean that al-Qaeda in any way is reestablishing re itself. Peter, thanks very much. Fran, thanks to you as well.